We sat here in Oslo with Jan and Chris from the band Ova, who've recently celebrated the 10 year anniversary. Uh, could you tell us a bit short about how the band started? <coughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, it started as a rec regular teen band playing you know, hard metal music in, in one of our parents' garage. Um, also, I think the motivation for starting a band was pretty strong at that time due to the, the black metal thing growing pretty strong in, in Norway. But there are no, no, you know, no deeper reasons, I think, when you're at that age, you only want to, you know, just get your groove on, I guess. <laughs> if we look a bit at the, the debut album, how was this album received? It was overall pretty well received, and uh, the the band quite rapidly grew into, uh, you know, a significant name in the in the Norwegian black metal underground as it was back then. Uh, uh, but but also during the, the last years, the album has has um, often been, you know categorized as you know a classic a true classic of of that period of the first kind of inklings of the the Norwegian black metal scene so bag tight has been released it's more or less a traditional black metal album and then you start transforming the band start shape shifting and Kvelsang are the follow up so what would you categorize it as i'm not sure what the the popular term would be but I guess it would fall into the, you know, the new wave kind of amateurish neoclassical, you know, genre. Yeah. Um, but I think that had something to do with, you know, just wanting to explore a certain aesthetic that was that was incorporated into the black metal format. So 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 at that time, I don't think the grand kind of metamorphosis that happened later was kind of you know that wasn't en envisioned at that time because that, that's where I wanted to get to with the 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 next album Nathan's Madrigal which is even more <coughs> violent and brutal than the first album I've heard that it's supposed to have been recorded in the woods is this true or is it just a rumor <laughs> no I just think that's pure pure uh, commerce from from our label at that time, which was uh, Century Media. They always use these cheap and uh, superficial arguments in order to, you know, to push their records and stuff like that. So. We could say that you more or less leave that genre and you release the themes from William Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell album. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also the first album that you released through Jester Records, your own label. Why did you want to set up your own label? Uh, I think partly due to 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 uh, what I explained earlier with uh, with um, our kind of feeling of of not really you know being in the right uh, company with with Century Media and all this this kind of growing uh, growing commerce around you know black metal at that point the ban had grown to a certain uh, level sales wise and all this so so we kind of knew that we could set up our own label and and make it work financially and the inspiration is obviously William Blake's prose and illustrations it's almost a, a rock opera-ish conceptual album where you're blending back and forth through different genres what sort of reactions did you get well actually the what I prefer to call the Blake album is is uh, commercially speaking the most successful album we've released, like sales wise in terms of of that. Uh, I don't view it as as a personal you know the, the personal biggest success, but it's uh, it did very very well commercially, and and that was kind of funny because part of the argument we had with with our former label Century Media was kind of their their you know somewhat negative 
reactions to the to the rough material that I sent them. I don't think they believed that that would you know go home in a metal audience. Right. So you follow up the William Blake album with the Metamorphosis EP, which, in my opinion, sums up and glances forward, and also as it says on the album, acts as an audio trailer for Perdition City. And the final track, Wolves and Withdrawal, sort of goes into territory that the two silence EPs return to later. When you do these short experiments on albums which stick out a bit, that's not the same as the rest of the album, are they sort of trailers to test what people react to them? Or I strongly believe that we, we, we have a, a certain... Uh, you know, Joker mentality. <laughs> That's always been there. Which brings us to Perdition City, Music to an Interior Film, which is a very descriptive title for an album which is a mix of bombastic beats, noir, jazz, and vulnerable ambient emotions. So what sort of a place was the band in around this time, and what were the inspirations for Perdition City, which is another step in a di- different direction? I think before that album, I'd been listening a lot to to very minimal music, and kind of stopped listening to 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 sound where everything just comes like a fist in your face all the time. Uh, <clears throat> so musically, that was kind of the agenda all the time to to keep it to keep it down. I think maybe. Uh the process of making music started taking different directions, probably on the Metamorphosis EP as well. And I kind of just started to work out the music in another way, and that also reflects the, uh, the outcome in the end. The whole rebellious aspect turned from being very extrovert to, of course, going straight up our own ass. <laughs> So, so it, it all became a very interior process, and, and the music, of course, reflects that. So it ref- reflects a lot of personal changes. Good, because it brings us more or less up to date with the Lycanthropen themes, but in between the, there's t- the two silence EPs. Yeah. W- w- what made you lay aside the vocals? Why did you decide to release two EPs without any vocals on them? I think that's a, a continuation of, of the... the, um, the the 180 from extra to intro. Mm. Um, so I think those EPs were, I regard them as studies. Yeah. They're not, you know, perhaps as easy to, to understand for the audience, and that's that's also why they were quite limited. Like we just mentioned uh, Lycanthropen, which is the, the soundtrack to Steve Erickson's short film. The Lycanthropen themes is quite a powerful and you know at the same time vulnerable soundtrack and yeah but, but also by, by necessity more minimal I think that's something you very quickly discover when you start to to put sound on an actual film that Perdition City would would be too much on top of a movie as as uh, Le Cantropa so what do you think of the film considering the the premises being a very independent film uh, with practically no money. I think the outcome is is fantastic. And I think uh, the I think Steve has done a marvelous job. I also <coughs> think that uh, that uh, the film Le uh has a similar or or a somewhat related. Um, way of envisioning things and the effect of things the film is also pretty subtle i think and and i think that 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 kind of that's similar to the way we think of of music so that's interesting that kind of that combination what i like about the movie is the way it um, it's quite concrete it's very minimal setting not too much people and the story is quite simple, uh, and it develops in a very subtle, kind of abstract way. What I don't like about the film uh, is uh, is the end. I think it's too overexposed in a way, completely compared to how it evolves. 
I think it should be sub all the way. Apart from receiving good reviews for the album, you also received a nomination for a Norwegian Spielmann Prize in the open genre class for the soundtrack to Le Cantropen. I mean, considering the, ori- uh, the, the competition that you were up against, there was three neo-jazz oriented bands, uh, ceramic folk singers, I mean, it was quite serious competition, so I mean, it must have been a great motivator for the band. It felt okay to, to, to be nominated in that class, but apart from, from that, I, f- I perhaps feel that the whole circus around these kind of Grammy awards is... <clears throat> It's very coincidental as well. You've just celebrated the first 10 years as over with a, a remix compilation called The First Decade in the Machines. Uh, it's a very global collection of participants on the album. I mean, there's Third Eye Foundation from the England, there's Merzbauer from Japan, uh, as well as uh, Norwegian Upland, who are one of the bands signed to Jester Records. Mm. Many bands, including yourselves, seem to have favoured to do remixes of the old trilogy. I th- think the distinction there is basically uh, was, uh, the the noise artists took care of you know the the old part of the catalog, whereas the the more you know modern or futuristic sounding of the the involved parties uh, took care of um, you know more recent sounds. How does the way you create music today differ from the way you create music in the earlier years? Not necessarily as much as people think. We prefer to to record the the real shit, <laughs> so to speak, uh, if if we still can, of course. So when I mean most of the drums, uh, at least you know, like seventy percent of all the drums we use are kind of acoustic drums, at least initially. You know, we're not the we're not the total computer geek band yet. I think the uh, the concept of shape shifting uh, kind of when River started out, <coughs> uh, kind of as you said, uh, kind of uproar in a way. It's quite simple. You have these negations and uh, differences are very easy to put spot, and those practicing black metal still are trapped in the same schemes in a way and it's very easy to pluck it apart and uh, but by been doing all this kind of shiftings all the way uh, it's not that interesting to be brutal or explicitly black or it's become more or less a part of the backbone Mm. or a way of thinking and uh, and that makes it it's not so important to to stand out and be so fucking explicit all the way just we practice it. We don't know where it's going to take us, but that's not the point. I do foresee a slight return to to something a bit more rock and roll. Not not like rock and roll, but just just a bit. I foresee kind of going a slightly away from from the the, the very computer generated feeling towards something a you know like leaning perhaps a bit more back to the the, the uh, good old way of <laughs> playing music. So what lies ahead in the second decade for Olva? I mean, the Svidnika soundtrack, we know it'll differ from the Lycanthropen soundtrack, but well, what can we expect? Lycanthropen was our first foray into, you know, making score music, so... And, and, and we grew a lot, uh, I think, with that process being the first time we grew further uh, during the making of, of the the score for uh, Svidneger, um, which was also or is a feature film, which had significantly more money. Ne- necessarily, the music is uh, is more layered, more more or- orchestrated, more more kind of uh, like a slightly more commercial take on 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 score making you know i think i, I see the country open partly as as you know more experimental minimal um it's it's more of a left field kind of project whereas uh, sweden it was uh, 
commercially fueled from the from the start, you know. And 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 we we had to play a lot more ball as well with with all these people involved in that in that film, and and that wasn't necessarily a, a good experience. But but we we learned a lot through that as well. So you know, next time we do this, we we know how to you know improve and and make things even better. On your web page, there is a a sample for the Quick Fix for Melancholy EP. Mm. How, how how did this collaboration come around? Because the first thing I thought when I saw it was like, "Wow, well, we're going back to William Blake." It's it's lyrics, it's you know, poetry that we put music to. Uh, we had the wish doing uh, vocals again in a much more integrated part of the music, and um, and uh, the clip on the net, the sample is uh, by a Canadian author, uh, which is a beautiful text. Uh, which I have been working with in other contexts. And uh, I showed it to Chris and we decided this is something mm. which can work with the kind of themes and moods in uh, the uh, EP. But uh, that's... Uh, we also used another... Um, yeah, by... Lyric. Yeah. Half a year ago we started writing a lot of lyrics and interviewing ourselves and stuff like that. Uh, for making more text to integrate with the music on the next uh, full length. I think, I think yeah. And uh, we used one of those uh, lyrics uh, also on the EP, uh, which we have written ourselves. <coughs> and, um, and I think yeah. there's there's definitely definitely an, an ever increasing kind of awareness that that uh, that uh, text is extremely important. And uh, treating text and writing requires a different insight and a different kind of cleverness, or uh, and, and 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 that's something that's a challenge we're kind of taking on now that we we really want to to put back some substance into to the music through language through text you know through through writing so there ain't going to be bullshit lyrics on the next record <laughs> for sure the coming album utopian enterprises mm. where do you plan to take us this time we're in the middle of the process right now so trying to pinpoint what it's going to be is not possible i think oh but, but, but that kind of but we have some we have some ideas and uh, kind of not rules but principles we are trying to incorporate, mm. uh, which are uh, formulated much stronger now than, for example, on the silence uh, EPs and uh, on the film scores as well. There there is music for something else. This is going to be our process fully. But I, th I think the music the music is going to support the texts. Yep, more absolutely. than the other way around and uh, some of the magic uh, that happens when 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 we write together or or we 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 something occurs in the studio is it's um it's hard to say why this is good or why it kind of speaks uh to us and it's also extremely hard for us now to know you know whether this is going to lead us into extremely narrow kind of listening environments and all this or go the exact opposite route to to you know something far greater all right chris yeah thank you very much no problem no problem our pressure